Uh, welcome uh, to our biggest uh, module of the class, Application Layer. And today I will be talking about the main name system, or uh, DNS in short, what it is, uh, how it's been used, and the actual details of the protocol. Uh, first of all, what, why do we need this DNS system? Uh, so first of all, just to think uh, on a high level. So every, everything needs to have some kind of identifier. As uh, United, in the United States, we have like social security number, like everybody have like name, their passport that is, and so forth. So the people themselves have been identified as kind of various uh, identifiers. On the internet, uh, each host has IP address, and as we'll learn more in the next modules, uh, there's like IP addresses, T TCP port numbers to identify the specific application and so forth. Another thing that's been used on the internet as well, uh, which is in addition to actually naming the machines, naming the mm, kind of identifiers and the port numbers are the host names. Uh, so these ones are the most familiar to you is something like www.google.com and so in and other ones. So these ones you cannot really use directly mm, kind of to, con to create a TCP connection. Rather, you need to convert that um, host name to the IP address. And this is where a uh, DNS system uh, in coming into, into the play. Uh, in addition to this uh, simple conversion of the uh, host names to the IP addresses, uh, DNS uh, is actually a database. And this database can be used to store and provide the mapping for other types of information. So one uh, major thing uh, that people are using the DNS for is the mail servers. Uh, like to identify what is the server, what is the host name, or and subsequently IP address of the mail servers uh, that correspond to the domain name. So, and every time uh, you actually send in the email, uh, the system behind the, the SMTP server behind uh, the scenes actually making a DNS query for this MX record to figure out what are the mail server and trying to figure out how to connect to those things. So this is kind of one of the few items that being used. And uh, throughout the lecture, I will show you a few more uh, examples of this. Uh, DNS uh, has some similarities to HTTP. It is using, uh, it is, it uses um, the simple query re reply pattern. Uh, like I'm establishing some form of connectivity or not. Uh, so this one, uh, caveat that uh, on the next bullet. And then there is a request and then there is a reply. Uh, similar to HTTP, everything is kind of named and every time you uh, query something, you query it by name. And effectively given a name of the record and types of the record that you would like to request. Uh, the second one, um, which is not similarity, but rather a little bit of difference, is it runs on top of UDP normally. Uh, you still can run DHTP, or you can still run DNS on top of the TCP, but people usually don't do that because it's additional latency involved in uh, establishing a TCP connection versus uh, usually what happens, uh, there's only one packet exchange. I'm asking question about something and immediately getting reply back. How exactly it happens, uh, we'll show later. Uh, so that's kind of the good parts of uh, DNS system. Uh, there's a small, small uh, bad part of the DNS system is uh, security. Uh, so there is a, a significant concerns of, um, of, kind of uh, integrity of the whole system. Uh, there are solutions in place uh, to, um, to make sure that the records that have been returned to you are legitimate ones and not kind of uh, substituted by, by someone, somebody else. But even with this uh, security in place, not all, not all information is secured yet. So it's kind of the security as of right now, is still optional element and not everybody's actually checking it. Let's move to the major parts of the DNS system. Uh, so there are slightly different uh, concepts here, but effectively it's a part of the whole uh, infrastructure. So the first part, and I will gonna be talking more extensively about this, is the namespace. So there's a, a very strict hierarchical namespace and everything is within this hierarchical namespace. Uh, the second one is a, a distributed database. So the fact that everything, um, every record is put uh, in the system in the, some form of a distributed and actually federated way. So it's kind of federation is a distribution and the different authorities responsible for different pieces of information. And uh, finally, there are so-called authoritative servers that are providing uh, this information to the system um, and being set up by the people who owns part of the namespace. In addition, there is a uh, caching resolvers. Uh, so these guys are 
um, providing additional service in, inside the system, and everything is effectively running DNS queries. Um, okay, so there's a few more comments on the slide. So the authoritative name servers, uh, are those uh, provided by the domain owners, and the caching resolvers usually provided by, uh, by internet service providers like AT&T and Comcast. Um, today, it's a common practice to use Google uh, caching resolver or some other caching resolvers that are available uh, publicly. Uh, go to, let, let's go to the hierarchical namespace. So this one, some of these uh, elements of the namespace is very in intimately familiar to you because everybody is using something within .com, everybody is using Gmail, almost everybody. Uh, but uh, there are other uh, elements on this namespace. And to give you an idea, uh, everything starts with the root. So even though we don't really specify this root or da initial dot uh, or the last dot at the end, uh, it, it kind of exists implicitly. And afterwards, there's uh, something that can, uh, that can follow. Uh, you can have a lot of different uh, levels. So the physical limit is 127 levels that you can have uh, the main names. Uh, but it's rarely used, so I haven't really seen uh, that many uh, names, uh, that many components as part of the domain name. And uh, each of the uh, each of the subdomain names, or yeah, subdomain names, is limited to 255 characters. So you can have a lot, a lot of things as part of the um, actual domain name. Uh, I mean, the maximum name is actually not 255 multiplied by 127 because it would be limited by the size of the UDP packet, which is actually 2 to the 16. And uh, every, effectively, every leaf on this uh, and every non-leaf uh, element of uh, this tree is effectively some form of a domain. Uh, domain is kind of a little bit overloaded term, uh, which can represent different things in different uh, contexts. But effectively, you can think of just a, a, if you pick an, a node on a tree and you call it a domain, so it will correspond to this particular part of the namespace and everything below it. Uh, th there will be another term that I will introduce later, uh, zone. So that one is a little bit different. It's more like a subset of the domain or like more uh, on administrative sites. This slide highlights uh, several uh, top-level domain names that you can see. Uh, I hope uh, most of these are familiar to you. And logically, you can separate them in actually three categories. Uh, only two shown here, but there are several categories. One of them are global top-level domain names. So like edu, .com, .gov, .org. So these ones, I mean, these are logically a representation. So they, this technically can belong to any website, any entity that want to buy this name uh, across the globe. Then there's a country level TLDs that are kind of specifically designed uh, or designated uh, to represent websites or entities uh, in specific uh, countries. Uh, but in some cases, uh, people using uh, these domain names are not free to use these domain names outside the country as well. Uh, there are a few, uh, for example, this in Adri ARPA is a special domain zone, and there are a few of those. And uh, the final, the third category that I'm uh, showing here is generic top level domain names. So these ones are similar to top-level domain names. In, in principle, they're kind of also global, also belong to any entities that, despite the country, but they're just a reason, reasonably recent addition to DNS protocol, and they're kind of a little bit flexible. They can appear, they can disappear, depending on, um, on the management of the DNS zone. Uh, the one that I mentioned here is also the um, special um, international country called uh, top-level domain names. Uh, but they exactly in the same realm as the uh, country uh, country code uh, top level domain names, so just uh, in different language. So the, uh, I already mentioned that the um, DNS is a distributed and federated uh, database effectively, and uh, what is, uh, starts uh, the whole process are so called the root name servers. And um, I will use word the root zone in, in this specific case, and we will get to the point what it is. Uh, but effectively, it's a bootstrapping for the whole DNS system. So there are uh, designated uh, 13 so-called servers. There are kind of, more actual servers, but uh, kind of, there is a logical 13 companies that represent those uh, uh, root zones that effectively provide the, some bootstrapping for the top-level domain names, for the country code domain names, for those internalization, uh, and, and others. 
And as I highlighted, uh, even though there's a 13 logical uh, root uh, name servers worldwide, uh, the number of actual servers and actual data centers that represent uh, those uh, 13 name servers are actually much, much, much larger. And if you go to this uh, root-servers.org, uh, you can find a long list of um, kind of locations and IP addresses of, of, the, of those uh, root servers. And this is just a highlight of the map of where they belong in different places. And uh, to highlight, and this is a little bit jumping ahead of uh, our lectures, so the, the way uh, this actually happens, so there are 13 designated IP addresses effectively, and uh, the ISPs are using the technique called Anycast to announce this IP address using a global routing protocol from different places. And depending on uh, which place in, uh, in the world you are, like uh, topologically, you will get to the closest data center uh, and kind of effectively get the answer from the closest uh, place. I just mentioned that uh, the whole bootstrapping process uh, for the DNS starts with the root zone. But normally, kind of as a consumers, we don't deal with the root zone directly. And those are technically responsible for uh, registering uh, top-level domain names. So those companies that want to obtain this generic uh, top-level uh, top level domain names, they may need to uh, go uh, to the IANA that is re responsible for uh, top-level domain names. But normally we don't do that. Some zones, so for example, .com are really, really huge. And uh, technically there is not a single organization that uh, provides the servers to register the names. So there's uh, actually multiple organizations that they can sell you the servers. And they did it uh, semi-intentionally to allow um, kind of more competitive pricing, more services provided by different companies and so forth. So they, it's effectively what happened, they separated the, uh, kind of the company who manages the actual zone, uh, meaning uh, who providing the information to queries, and uh, who adding uh, entries to, the, to that zone. So for, so one of them is a registry. So registry is the place uh, to whom you contact uh, whenever you querying. So that's kind of organization that provided the actual authority of name service. And then there is an organization called registrar. So this one uh, is doesn't provide any response to the queries, but rather it have a contract with the consumers or registrants and. Uh, collecting the information, collecting some user information, uh, contact information, and when everything is connect, uh, collected, the fees uh, collected as well, uh, it provides some um, information what to put in the top-level domain uh, name zone. There's kind of that separation, there are multiple registrars, there's a single registry for the name, domain name, and uh, kind of registrants, there are tons of registrants in, in the place in the first place. And uh, the first question that I would like to ask you, uh, so this is kind of a free question uh, for everybody. Um, so m m some of you maybe already have a domain name. Uh, so if you already do that, just let me know uh, which registrar uh, you went to. Uh, if uh, you didn't have the domain name, just to try to Google and see uh, where would you go uh, to get a domain name. Maybe you already know something, but mm, just give me some answer for this one. Now, uh, getting more to the details of the DNS protocol. So one of the fundamental uh, part of the DNS protocol is the concept of the de delegation. So that's kind of the fundamental for the purpose of uh, creating this federation. So the DNS is distributed and federated and the delegation is the mechanism to do this delegation. So effectively uh, on a high level, on the top level, the main uh, top level, so the, there's a top level uh, root zone that delegates uh, authority for the kind of top level domain names uh, to some, uh, some parties. Then uh, individual top level domain names delegate the control over uh, domain and whatever is under this domain to specific parties. So for example, nominum um, domain name uh, is being delegated from com to do whatever it wants. And then it can sub-delegate it uh, like east to somewhere else, sub-delegate sub www, or even just providing uh, this information in there. And uh, the fact that you can do this delegation, and actually we can do selective delegation, creates the concept of DNS zones. So remember uh, what I mentioned. So there's a difference between the main itself and the zone. So the domain is a, just pick the point in the namespace and everything below this, uh, including the, the whole thing, uh, including the lead node uh, in the namespace is the main name itself. 
and a zone is potential can be crafted part of uh, that domain uh, domain uh, there can be one zone representing the whole domain there can be two zones three or four zones representing the main or like an un unlimited uh, amount of various dns zones and the point of the zones is you delegate the control so as soon as you uh, have a domain name and you delegate a control of the subdomain or uh, sub 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 subdomain to a specific zone, that entity is now responsible to uh, adding entries into that database. And you don't have control, I mean, unless you undelegate the zone. Uh, and the other party is effectively doing everything that needs to be done for that domain name. And uh, just to highlight what can be done, as already said, that's the whole domain name. Uh, you can delegate part uh, that nominum, uh, just WWFTP. Uh, you can subdelegate part to AMS. You can subdelegate part to RWC. So this is just to think of the again. Uh, I'm repeating what I just said is the main, and the uh, main includes either one zone or multiple zone depending on the management needs of that specific uh, domain. Uh, to give you uh, de details of the uh, structure of the records themselves, or like structure of what information can be included in the database. So everything inside this uh, DNS database is stored in form of so-called resource records. And those resource records are associated with a specific uh, domain name. So in this specific case, the main name or just name is just one leaf node or whatever node. So just the whole thing, there's nothing underneath in this specific context. Uh, so we have a name, uh, we have uh, some, some stuff underneath. And what this uh, some stuff underneath is uh, uh, type. So this is the type of the record that associated with the, with the specific name. And uh, various uh, information that associated with the actual type, like data. And uh, there's another important value is a TTL, or time to live. And I'll talk a little bit later about this one. Uh, the common types, uh, kind of the fundamental types are uh, a record uh, that's representing the mapping between the uh, um, name or host name to IP address, IPv4 address. Uh, there is a quad A record that represents mapping between host name and IPv6 address. Uh, there is a very important NS record, uh, which represents the, uh, the delegation, the, the fact that some specific zone or subzone has been delegated further to a different name, service, uh, name server and that name server will be responsible for the further. And uh, there are a few additional things. Uh, I'll just uh, like to talk more uh, about them on this slide. Uh, so there's one, uh, one more uh, fundamental part is a start of this uh, authority. Uh, you not necessarily will be dealing with the start of authority in uh, everyday uh, DNS queries, but just remember that's also part of the uh, fundamental parts uh, of the DNS. And this effectively describes the zone itself. Like if you start in the management of the zone, a start of authority will define what is the serial number of the zone, what the administrative contacts, and some other information about the zone. There are many more uh, types of records. I'm just showing you a few of them. Uh, the one that's very popular are, are this MX record. Uh, so effectively, this one is representing uh, records that define what are the mail servers uh, for this domain name. Uh, TXT is any plain text information. And recently, it has been used for security purposes to associate some um, information about the domain name uh, in the security context. Uh, is specifically used by the email service. Uh, uh, remember this SPF and um, I forgot the other name, um, checks uh, for the SMTP protocol to, to validate the, the sender. Uh, so this being used as part, uh, kind of being stored as part of this TXT record. Uh, PTR is a kind of a record that um, pointing to the address, to the IP address, and effectively is, uh, is being used to do the reverse mapping. It's from the IP address, specially formatted, uh, to the host name. And I'll show a few examples in the special zone. But I mean, technically it can be used everywhere, but uh, primarily used in the special zone that I'll mention in a few seconds. And finally, there's a very popular record called SRV, is uh, to describe uh, some specific service. So it, uh, it's Sometimes it's used to describe, oh, this is the printer service and it's on this host name on this port. There is uh, some other service on this host name with this port. One more thing I would like to mention is uh, a difference between, or like a 
complementary uh, properties of the resource record and resource record set. Uh, so the interesting part of DNS is the identification of the what you're requesting is actually name and the type. And uh, within the name and the type, you can have multiple records. So the example uh, on the slide showing uh, that you can have multiple uh, A records for the same domain name. So in, I gave you example with this uh, mail.ru. Uh, but in many, many, many other cases, if you mm, try to Google or try to uh, get the DNS query for like csfi.edu, you most likely will get uh, multiple records from that. Uh, class, uh, so this one, uh, this record is not really being used in today, so it's just we have only one internet class uh, of the record. On this slide, I just wanted to highlight the kind of example content of the zone. Uh, so as you can see, there's a kind of logical, uh, everything is like logically separated here. So it's just one, it's one database, like local database. So there are some NS records that are presenting delegation. Uh, in this case, it's uh, just explaining who are responsible for this specific zone and just pointing to the those name servers. Uh, there's a description of mail servers. It just pointing to two different mail servers. And some domain names like NS1, Mail, Joe, WW, FTP, and whatever. Uh, C name record that you can see on the slide is uh, very similar to A record. It's just uh, uh, providing a way to do indirection. So with A record, you have to specify the IP address. With the C name, you can specify the host name. And then like that host name is supposed to correspond to some specific IP address. So just kind of one level of indirection in, in cases it's necessary or desirable. Uh, you can explore uh, DNS records uh, using dig command, uh, like dig, and uh, this is one of the examples uh, that I did uh, in the past. Uh, if you try to do the, do the same, you should get some similar result. Uh, most likely, you're not going to get exactly the same result, no, at least not for the A and Quad A records, because those really depend on uh, where you are and where you're asking from, because the Google uh, name service, Google authority name service will give you different results uh, depending on where you're asking from. And that's like done for the load balancing and uh, we'll talk about the next module about when I'm uh, talking about the content delivery networks. And uh, this is again the same example, we just uh, I gave you example of the actual live zone that I'm managing. Uh, so this one, again, there are multiple ways how the zone actually managed in real life. Uh, in the simplest case, it's simple text file that represents uh, line by line uh, records. In more complex ways, it's an like, actual database like Oracle database or something else that has some internal structure. Uh, there is one more thing that I'm not showing here is the security. Uh, and that if you like very carefully looking at this slide, there's a include of the DNS key. Uh, so this one is is used to provide authentication for each record and there are tools associated kind of when you run on the site to kind of sign each individual records. Um, but uh, I'm not going to be talking about this today. This is one I, I was promising to talk a little bit more in detail and uh, so-called reverse DNS lookup. Uh, for IPv4 and IPv6, there are two special zones. So for IPv4, there is an in other ARPA domain and the whole purpose of this domain name is to provide the mapping between um, IP addresses and the host names. Um, how it can be useful? Uh, so one of them, uh, one of the uses uh, highlighted on the slide, and you already seen in the previous lectures, uh, when I tr did some form of a trace route. So when I did a trace route, um, it kind of the whole process was done using just IP addresses. Like if I provided host name, it was converted to um, IP address and kind of the trace route was continued with just IP addresses. But then when uh, the system was displaying the results, it was showing me not just IP address, unless I request it with the minus N option, but rather some kind of host names. And this is done effectively using this special zone. Um, how it's formatted, it's just interesting way of uh, how people a little bit cheated uh, of this operation. Uh, so the zone is this in other ARPA, and then there's in the reverse fashion, you include the IP address. So for example, uh, this uh, zone representing the point for IP address 1.2.3.4. Uh, if I was picking any other address, it would be, like for example, this one, uh, it would be uh, 138, 19, 14, 107 in other ARPA. 
and the, the host name, if it exists, will be presented in form of this SRV record. And in a dig command, if you're playing with it, uh, there's actually simplification instead of uh, manually uh, con like reversing order um, of the uh, of the IP address and adding this in other ARPA and specifically requesting for the SRV record. You can just use minus X option and providing the IP address, and dig command will be smart enough to actually convert it on its own. Um, in another use of this lookup, at least in the past, was uh, as part of the um, some uh, some very basic uh, security checks. Uh, like for example, a mail server, uh, whenever it receives connection from the remote host, it will try to check uh, whether that host has a, a reverse uh, host name as part of the reverse zone. And if it doesn't, it will kind of trigger a um, kind of higher score for the spam filtering. And uh, not really used today, but at least uh, was popular uh, back then. Now, um, I, I think I already mentioned a few things before. Uh, so the core and fundamental part of the DNS are the name servers. So these guys are storing the information. So in providing this information as, as an in form of zone and zone records, uh, whenever somebody is sending you the query. And uh, there are two types of uh, name servers. Uh, so one of them is a third of name server and the other one is a caching a name server. Uh, so kind of, as you can guess from, uh, from the name, uh, a third of name server is a 34 some specific uh, records or zone uh, and is provided by the uh, domain authority. And a caching is just something that uh, people go through uh, the server so the server can uh, get the records from um, a third of name server cached them for some time and that, that detail field that uh, I was uh, showing you earlier and then give results back. And it has very, very good uses and the very good uh, uh, reasons how, why you actually need the caching resolvers or caching servers. And to give you just a small highlight um, kind of differences be or correlation between name servers and zones. Uh, so one name server can technically serve multiple zones and one zone can exist on different name servers. So like in, um, in case that the zone been replicated at, in two different places, in two different authoritative name servers, it will exist in two, two different places. Uh, and again, the same IP address, the same service can uh, actually serve two different zones. Like if I have authority over nominum.com and isc.org, then I have authority on the same name server to do this job. If not, okay, then not. Uh, to give you a full picture, like, okay, not really full picture, but rather some uh, simpli simplified form of the full picture, uh, just think of uh, zones and the records. Uh, so the errors don't really represent anything beyond the, the fact of the delegation. Uh, so the root zones don't really communicate that much with the, or at all with the .NET or that edu or that edu zone by itself doesn't really communicate, but it's a rather logical um, connection between the zones. So like if there's a if that edu has ns record pointing to um, for like for UCLA that edu down to somewhere else, then the zone has been delegated and edu no longer deals with that kind of details of that zone. Rather uh, refers every request uh, to something more specific inside that uh, UCLA that edu zone to that or to one of those uh, name servers. And that effectively that exists on every level. Um, already I highlighted a few things. Uh, I already mentioned the authoritative server, caching resolvers or caching servers. Uh, so one thing that uh, I want to switch a little bit my language. Um, so I said that there's a caching name server and I was trying to, I mean, when I keep pronouncing it, I said the resolver. Uh, so resolver is effectively just different part of the uh, DNS uh, service. So the name server is the one who is providing um, uh, information and resolver is try the one who is getting the information. And uh, we have like effectively two types of the resolvers. One of the um, stub resolvers. So these are very, very simple resolvers and basically they exist on every uh, and system and as part of the operating system and they only know how, how to send queries to the caching resolvers. And uh, caching resolvers are basically configured, uh, like the IP address of the caching resolver is configured in a system over the DHCP protocol, for example, or manually if you really like to do configure everything manually. 
and the caching resolver is part of the caching name server and this guy is actually sending queries to authoritative name servers. And uh, to highlight the whole process, uh, so now we, what I'm talking about here is the stub resolver, uh, caching resolver and the caching uh, name server. So this kind of two uh, sides of the same uh, of, of the same entity. And finally, the authoritative servers of a root server or root zone, uh, authoritative server for the .edu, authoritative server for uh, UCLA.edu. And whenever, uh, for example, let's say there's nothing was cached initially and uh, there's a, some guy woke up and want to do to get IP address of www.ucla.edu or like www.fiu.edu and it wants to get IPv4 address, for example. So the first step, uh, what's going to happen is this stub resolver will send a query to the caching resolver because that's the only operation that stub resolver know how to do. And uh, the stub resolver will be expecting some answer from the caching resolver. Whether it gets this answer, not gets this answer, that's a different question. It can get the positive answer, it can get negative answer, or it can time out and not get, a, get any answer. In this case, um, kind of no communication will actually can happen afterwards. But assume everything is fine and the stub resolver successfully send the query to the caching resolver. Now it's a job of the caching resolver to actually found out the answer. Uh, as, as I said, if we have an assumption that there is no prior communication happened and the, effectively our cache is empty, then the caching resolver have to invoke so-called iterative query. And for the purpose of iterative query, uh, the caching resolver have to go from the top, like from the top meaning from the root. Uh, because it doesn't know what is the authority for the UCLA that it use on. So you have no idea about that. The only idea the caching resolver has is about the 13 name servers uh, that I mentioned before. So those uh, information about those 13 logical uh, name servers is pre-configured at every single caching resolver. So there's like special file, sometimes it's updated, but effectively it exists as a static information. So now it got the question from the stub resolver. It simply returns back, uh, like turns around and asks the same question to the root server. Um, root server obviously would not know uh, the exact answer, what is the IP address for the www.ucla.edu, but rather it would know uh, how to answer question about the .edu zone, because that's the whole, the only knowledge the root zone knows about. And in, so it will, what it will do, it simply re returns so-called uh, referral uh, we're just saying that, oh, I don't know the answer, but uh, here's the name servers that may know the answer. So you just contact them, contact them and don't bother me about this anymore. Now, uh, so the caching resolver got the referral. Uh, from this referral, it actually infers that it can ask question to the next level server or next level zone. And it uh, kind of, again, turns around and asks the same question that was received before uh, to that EDU server. So it's again, it's asking, oh, what is the IP address for www.ucla.edu to uh, that edu uh, name server? Again, that, that edu name server doesn't have authority over UCLA, uh, ucla.edu, and it only may know uh, that ucla.edu was delegated further. So instead of giving the actual answer back, uh, that, that edu server simply again, sending another referral. And that referral ind ind indicate, oh, so this is a, this record may be available at the, at the name server that represents UCLA.edu. And again, cache resolver got the answer back and send in a, another query to a different name server. In this case, UCLA.edu. In this case, uh, if we happen to reach the server that actually know the answer, it will immediately uh, give us the answer back and we kind of happily continue our communication. If not, uh, it may kind of, uh, uh, kind of, this record may have existed in next level somewhere. Um, so it's kind of may get another referral to somewhere else uh, or it just give you a, a answer immediately. To give you a few small ideas, uh, I don't think you, you need to remember details of, the, of this uh, query response model, but just remember uh, kind of the very, very high level thing. Uh, so first of all, uh, the message, uh, unlike the HTTP and SMTP, uh, everything is done in binary. 
And uh, not just binary, there's also a lot of uh, um, simple compression mechanism involved in the protocol to optimize the uh, uh, amount of data being transferred inside the, inside the records. So then uh, another, another thing to remember is uh, four parts of, uh, of the request response or the query reply. And uh, each query can have one or multiple uh, records as part of the query element. And each response can have multiple uh, or one or multiple answers as part of this uh, answer count, authority record, uh, and additional information. Uh, some of this, uh, obviously, just additional information that may be included uh, kind of if uh, at whatever server that responding may think that uh, this record will be useful for, uh, for the user or maybe not included uh, depending on, uh, on what you do. Like, but just remember that this uh, uh, records are grouped uh, into the question, uh, answer, authority, uh, additional information. Most important ones are the query in the query and answer as part of the answer. Uh, but sometimes as part of the answer, especially when we do uh, a redirection, uh, we will find the information as part of this NS record, uh, or like authority record and additional information because there will be no actual answer, but rather referral instead of the answer. And uh, finally, I already highlighted this process. I want to move to the um, details of the recursive and iterative caching. Uh, I, I think in words I already highlighted. So in recursive, uh, it's kind of between the stub resolver and the caching name server. Uh, it's simple one query and you send the query and you're waiting for the response. You get something, you get something, you didn't get something, then uh, you fail. Uh, with iterative, it's much more complicated process and as I will highlight a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, so you send the query to one of the name servers that you think may get the answer back. Uh, you may get the answer, you may get the referral, you may get the timeout. If you, in the last case, you can actually try a different uh, name server, uh, different authoritative name server that may give you the actual result. So that's kind of, this one is to provide some form of uh, redundancy or uh, reliability to the protocol. And uh, finally, a few examples, uh, so you can try to do these examples at home. Um, so you can do, um, you can ask for recursively about the IPv4 record for the www.domain.com. You may get the answer, you may get a timeout, you may get the negative answer. Uh, you can ask for the quad A or IPv4 record, IPv6 record for the www.google.com. You can get, for example, this one. Uh, you can ask for the TXT record, you can ask for the MX record. So in all cases, uh, what I'm showing here, uh, I'm actually showing you a very small extract from, uh, from the actual answer. Uh, it gives you just the question that you ask. And it happened to give you information because I had the connectivity and I was asking about information that is available. In the iterative query, so the example I'm giving you on this slide is just for one type of the query. So it's just one, like this, the last part that I was asking as part of the recursive. So I'm, I'm asking what is the MX record for the csfiu.edu. And if I'm doing real, real uh, error, non-recursive query or like iterative query using D command, I have to start from the top. And uh, this top, I actually went to this uh, website and a website and I picked one of the name servers uh, that represent the root. And just kind of uh, to represent that I'm this cache resolver that being pre-configured those IP addresses. And I sent this query and I didn't get the answer back. So as I promised that uh, the root service will not gonna give you me actual answer for the MX record for the cs.fi.edu, but rather I got a referral. And this referral as part of this uh, authority section and the additional section, uh, it, it told me that edu record is respon like, being responsible by the edu-service.net. And as part of the additional records, it actually told me what uh, IP address I need to contact and if I really want to communicate with that uh, server. So that's kind of all I got from the root zone. Uh, but that uh, should be enough for me. Uh, like, uh, with this record, uh, with this information, I actually was able to uh, con construct another query. And note, uh, I'm, again, I'm using the same question. I'm still asking what is cs.fiu.edu, what is like MX record, but now I'm just asking question to a different uh, name server. In this case, I'm asking to one of the that edu uh, that servers that represent that edu zone. And similarly to the previous uh, answer, um, I didn't get the answer back. 
I still didn't get my NX records, uh, MX records, but rather I got NS record again uh, to a more specific name server. Again, uh, there's more records were available. I just picked one of them. Uh, just saying, oh, uh, I don't know the answer, but uh, you better contact the, the other name servers, this fiu.edu, and here's the IP address for this guy. Now I tried again. Uh, this time I contacted um, uh, .fiu.edu and one of the name servers uh, that know about uh, the whole thing about FIU. And this guy again didn't give me the answer because uh, cs.fiu.edu was delegated to the CS servers. And in the final step, I finally found out the IP address of the uh, one of the uh, name servers of cs.fiu.edu zone. And after I contacted that uh, name server, it gave me the answer and I was happily getting this answer as, 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 as output. Uh, one thing uh, just I want to highlight uh, as part of the, the whole process, every time I got the answer and I as a kind of logical uh, caching resolver, uh, every time this record was associated with some kind of a TTL field. And uh, the number that you can see in the, in the output is number of seconds that the that authority is advising me to cache the record. And uh, it's kind of interesting thing is that you can see, I don't even know how many days uh, that uh, for the root zone for the delegation uh, for the delegation for that edu. Uh, but effectively it highlights that if I single time somebody like doesn't matter who is uh, has asked question about something about edu. I would don't need to go to that uh, root server again for that amount of time. Uh, depending on the configurations, uh, the time can vary. So for example, uh, when I'm asking the question to that FIU.edu zone, so that one they just gave me 3,600 3, uh, seconds, so like 3,600. And um, so whenever people asking some information about uh, that FIU, uh, that FIU.edu, and then the FIU name server will receive uh, new requests, even though like repeated requests for the same thing every single day. But it's still, it's still uh, kind of limited to just one request uh, in a day for, to know something about uh, CS servers. And uh, for the next level, uh, again, we get in, uh, I think it's uh, representing one week of data, so mail servers is I expect it not to change too often and if somebody already know how to reach mail servers they're not going to send this query again and again and again and uh, all the cache resolvers can like uh, have this internal database that uh, they keep it uh, and updating and uh, removing records whenever they expired or kind of know when to ask uh, uh, for the information further I uh, already highlighted uh, for the bootstrapping process, for the stub resolvers, it's uh, uh, configured either manually or as part of the uh, DHCP process whenever you connect into the network. Uh, for the caching name servers, this is part of the package of the caching resolver. So there's like, this zone of, uh, of a static zone of 13 uh, name servers being configured in there. Um, just to highlight a few properties, uh, I think uh, I already highlighted this several times, but uh, uh, the whole point of uh, this DNS service to, uh, that makes it really, really robust is uh, replication and caching. Uh, both of them are kind of actually responsible for the same thing. They increase capacity, increase number of uh, places where the records can be served to you. It's just done in a different way. In the in form of replication, it's the guy who are responsible for the domain name um, setting up repl replicas of the of the zone. Like for example, this uh, uh, root zone is being replicated in very very many places, and uh, the caching is resp is responsibility of the kind of ISPs. So if the if the ISP want to reduce amount of traffic going out, like especially for the DNS queries, or if you if if it wants to speed up the process of um, uh, responding to, to queries to users. It sets up the cache and resolver, it gives this IP address to everybody, and now uh, cache and resolver instead of authoritative name server providing you the, you the results. I think uh, that's the most of the um, part of the DNS that I wanted to talk today. Um, it's, still, I have, it's still a lot. Um, I have highlighted, uh, at least I mentioned, uh, there are a few uh, security problems.
and I would advise you to read the, this uh, kind of the guide to DNS uh, vulnerability. Uh, that was a very, very, very serious vulnerability that was discovered, uh, which kind of implied some of the weaknesses uh, in the design protocol uh, that allowed the attacker like, that uh, exists in your local network to uh, redirect you to a completely different place, to the place that you're not expecting to go when you're trying to type www.google.com, for example. Uh, it was the big deal, uh, but uh, luckily it was solved to the extent. And uh, in today's environment, uh, the problem actually shifted from uh, kind of this type of the attack to uh, ensuring the authenticity of the information that we've been retrieving. Uh, because again, not all information is still being authenticated, even though we have the concept of DNSSEC uh, as part of the DNS protocol. And the other part that the people are working today is privacy. And this one is really, really complicated thing. Um, so one thing, is, so one for one important part. So whenever you go to, well, for example, some HTTP website, uh, like you're trying to communicate securely to, to your bank, um, the actual TCP connection that will be established and like all the communication uh, to the bank is secure and reasonably private. But the DNS query that was used to get the mapping from the domain name to the IP address that uh, representing the bank uh, was done in plain text. So that's kind of the interesting thing. Now, uh, anybody who can observe the traffic will know that you went to the bank. Uh, what they can do with this information, that's a different question, but that's kind of revealing some part of the privacy. And if you, in certain countries, uh, those people uh, don't really want you to go to certain types of the websites. So that's kind of the privacy people are trying to solve. Uh, and it's not easy as you may think. You cannot really put a kind of TLS connection uh, or have a TLS on top before uh, below the DNS or put DNS on top of the TLS uh, because you don't really want to run the TCP connection to incur the additional overhead and having TLS would require you to have a TCP connection. At the same time, um, there are some solutions done using UDP packets but again, even in those cases, people were able to infer what you're asking just by looking at the size of the packets. And it's not the exact science, but using like some frequency analysis, they were able to infer even the whole thing is encrypted, but they know that this is DNS query, uh, this is the size of DNS query, and then kind of this is the more, more popular queries, and this is kind of what you're actually asking for. Uh, so people still working on, uh, there are some solutions, uh, uh, if you're using VPN, then you effectively shift in the whole problem. Uh, some VPN solutions uh, proxy DNS queries, some uh, actually don't. Uh, so be aware of this part as well. Uh, so one uh, of the tasks uh, as part of this lecture, as part of the um, participation, uh, I would like you to do some small uh, DNS scavenger hunt. And what I want you to do is to discover different IP addresses of google.com. Uh, look, effectively, by just uh, doing a uh, dig query, uh, like a DNS query for the A records, uh, for IPv4 records, uh, for the google.com. What you can do and uh, what kind of IP addresses you can get, you can try to do it at different times of the day at home. Uh, you can try to do it at home and the university. Or you can actually try to do it um, from the same place, but using uh, different uh, name servers. And if you Google, uh, cache and resolvers, uh, you will be able to find uh, multiple, uh, multiple cache and resolvers, uh, like public ones. Uh, there are general public uh, cache and resolvers and there's actually a database that you can Google uh, that represent cache and resolvers, public cache and resolvers in different countries. And in those cases, you will be actually getting information uh, from the perspective of those countries. And you easily can get uh, more than 100 of IPv4 addresses representing the same google.com. Uh, but I'm just asking for at least 20. Okay, so that's it uh, for today's lecture. I hope uh, you got a really, really good idea of what DNS is. Uh, so DNS, even though it's a logically simple system, there's, oh, there's a namespace, uh, it's uh, quite complicated. And quite complicated because of the federated nature uh, of uh, namespace management uh, and the namespace management within the same domain. Uh, so you can delegate part, delegate subpart, and delegate uh, subdelegate and sub 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 delegate uh, further parts. Uh, 
so again, like try to infer uh, if you have additional questions, please feel free to contact me or start a new topic on a discussion forum. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you and see you later.